Hey, what's up, everybody? Draft is just around the corner, and the Patriots continue to be a major player. This is the Patriots Talk Podcast. We have Phil Perry coming in, but before we get the senator, we're going to talk to Sharon Moore. Who's Sharon Moore? He's the head coach of the University of Michigan. Why we want to talk to him? He's worked side by each with J.J. McCarthy for the past few years. And J.J., as you know, could be the apple of general manager, parentheses, de facto, close parentheses, general manager, Elliot Wolf. So that being the case, let's do a little bit more time kicking the tires on the most divisive of the top four quarterback prospects, J.J. McCarthy. Now, does Sharon have a dog in the fight? Yes, he does. Does that mean that we just dismiss his opinion completely, given that he was working in lockstep with the kid? No, it doesn't. So, Use your own judgment and enjoy Sharon Moore. All right, ladies and gentlemen, here is the head coach of the University of Michigan Wolverines, Sharon Moore. Hey, thank you so much for taking the time. And I want to jump right to the chase with um, J.J. McCarthy. There was a quote from Tiki Barber, tremendous NFL running back and analyst. He said, stop with the J.J. McCarthy thing. His film doesn't say he's a first-round quarterback. His film doesn't say I need to get rid of all my assets and go draft this guy because a lot of what he does doesn't translate. The scheme that he ran at Michigan, and maybe this is an indictment on the scheme, but it didn't highlight the things that you need to do. Sharon, you were an offensive coordinator the last few years with JJ, offensive line coach. What's the rebuttal for this player who's been so excellent or was so excellent in 2023? My rebuttal, the first thing is that High school, two state championships, um, transferred to IMG national championship, comes to Michigan, three Big Ten championships, and a national championship. So my rebuttal is he's the ultimate winner, competitor. Um, the skill set, the, the tight window throws, the decision making, the thing we put on this plate, uh, how he, his athleticism, his underrated athleticism, all those things will just be put on display when he gets the chance. And whoever drafts him is going to be very happy that they have J.J. McCarthy in his lock in their locker room as a leader, as a person, as an athlete, as a player. And um, I'm just excited to watch him, you know, prove himself right, prove us right, and do the things we know that he's he's capable of doing. Patriots have a guard named Andrew Stuber. They took in the seventh round in 2022. I know you got a cool anecdote from – JJ's freshman year about something that Andrew Stuber had said. I found that in another story. What what did Andrew Stuber have to say about JJ when JJ was a freshman? Yeah, when JJ was a freshman, Andrew, uh, who I love to death, was a little angry at times, which you kind of like out of your <laughs> offensive lineman. Uh, but, you know, he got in the huddle. I can't remember if it was training him. It might have been a game. And uh, he sat down. And after that, he said, I don't know what it is about this dude, but it makes me want to run through a wall for him. He said that kid has an it factor about him that makes you just want to run through a wall from him. And I remember that, and I just, you know, he has it. I've known the kid since he was a young man in high school, I think a freshman in high school, and watched his maturation to the time now. And then the things he did in high school, he does now, and, you know, the ability to make every throw and quick release and throw velocity and, uh, be able to go through reads and then be able to run and be an athletic and mm-hmm. improvise. And, you know, something he probably does the best is make, you know, improv plays. And uh, the guy's special and just so happy for him and his family. So you talk about the improv plays and the athleticism. I watched that ridiculous throwback that you decided to call or Jim or whoever called that against yeah, Alabama. I yeah, I called it. Yeah. It's a one-handed catch the kid made. Yeah. To me, of all the throws he made, and there were a lot of them, especially in some of those better games against Ohio State and Alabama, that play kind of encapsulated a lot of what you're looking for in a quarterback. You're not going to run the trick play all the time, but it showed toughness, accuracy, athleticism that you need. Do you agree with that statement? Yeah, 100%. Uh, he's a special athlete. He'd make one-handed <clears throat> catches and throws. We, we had a couple of trick plays up for him. Uh, where he'd be a receiver, do different things, and never ran him, never really wanted to, never really wanted to. And the reason I didn't run him a lot is, like, 
yeah, you run your quarterback. You better have two. Uh, I didn't want him taking those hits. So, and he'd ask all the time, Coach, am I going to run this week? No, not this week. Am I going to run this week? No, not this week. I'm just going to hand it to the guys behind you, Blake Corm and Donovan Edwards and Khalil Bowen and those guys. So, but he was, I mean, athletic, uh, you know, all those things. That 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 play really encapsulates of the type of player he is and fearless, gets up that play, coaches looking and yelling. He's like, oh, do we need to get another quarterback in? And, you know, J.J. being his, his witty self, takes the hit, gets up, grasps his face, and just nods his head, winks at me, and he just goes on about the next play. You mentioned how – handoffs were a big component because you were so good up front. You're so good in the backfield with Corum. Do you understand somewhat the skepticism based on the amount of production that you can look at with Caleb Williams or Jaden or Drake may even in terms of the reps, do you, do you understand the skepticism and, and JJ's rise, I guess. Yeah. I mean, I don't, I do, but I don't because I understand as a football player, as a quarterback, your number one goal should be to win. And he did everything to help his team win and everything he was asked his team to win. And yeah, maybe the yards aren't as much as the other guys, but he also has six rings. So that's something pretty, um, pretty cool to think of. And here's two from the big 10 championships to pass and we're getting four on Saturday. So uh, I think uh, he's pretty happy with what he's done and, you know, from a yards perspective, he doesn't have as many yards because uh, we we try to be as balanced as possible. And mm -hmm. you know, the name of the game to win is to win the game. So balance is a huge piece for us. But if we wanted to throw the ball 45, 50 times, 60 times within, we could have. Um, but then you'd be, you know, downgrading the, the ability that we have to run the football and keep people off balance. So I think for J.J., man, he's the sky's the limit with J.J. And I'm so excited for him. Where he could conceivably come if he comes to New England in number three, it's not going to be Michigan at this juncture. It's not what it was. It's a 4-13 and 13 team in a rebuild with an angry fan base because they're unaccustomed to what's going on, a media that's thirsty, and just watched a movie of a first-round pick that didn't work out. Yeah. Does J.J. have the requisite resilience at 21 to listen to the mountain of poop that it's going to get heaped on the Patriots for perhaps veering away from these guys who've been anointed as top three and the resilience to to sit through it as the team does go through tough times. Yeah, I think the the best example is a true example. We had a season in 2020 where we were two and four and JJ was just coming in as a freshman and he wrote a letter to our fan base, to our media and it, you know, basically said, hey, you know, be patient, trust the process, trust the class, trust the coaching staff, trust Michigan, and we're going to do everything we can to make sure that this is a top notch program. And uh, in comes his class, in comes his leadership, in comes the people around him. And he was a part of something extremely special that he, he continued to build um, with the kid, just the resiliency, the, the fortitude, the the toughness, the positivity that he's going to bring to whatever organization he goes to will be unmatched. The Patriots in 2021 drafted a national champion quarterback with great accuracy and a beautiful mind in the first round. And now three years later, they're going to do it again. You understand how the mm -hmm. NFL, it's cyclical. There's strength of schedule, there's draft position, yep. every there's contracts, guys filter in and out. People are nervous if J.J. McCarthy is the guy, because Mac Jones, for all the things that people loved in 2021, to be quite frank, he would have been unusable this year because the fan base had turned. Mm -hmm. How can you tell them they're not going to see the same movie? Yeah, I mean, I just – I don't know Mac. Uh, I'm I know. Sure it's it's unfair to him. I I hate yeah. to – and uh, I, I... – I know he was a great football player in college, and he still is a great football player, and he still does, you know, really good things. But I know JJ. I know who he is. I know his competitive spirit. I know his nature. I know, I mean, the the kid is is one of the best winners I've been around, and you know his story of what he's done and how he's been and his background. Uh, he's just he's just different. He's a different different breed of different breed of cat. And 
Um, you know, I can't promise you what the results are going to be. I can't promise the wins and losses, but I can promise you what it's going to look like from his perspective, a uh, phenomenal quarterback who's going to do everything that he's asked to do at a high level and be a great teammate. Would you think that he would need seasoning? It's a different level. He's 21. Would you yeah. think if you put yourself in those shoes, you know what, let's get him, let's get his feet wet and not start him right away. I mean, I've always thought of J.J. as a, the ultimate competitor. So he's a guy that I thought was ready, you know, even when we had our talks with him about, you know, should you come back, should you not? It was really not more of should you come back. It was just, hey, what do we need to do to get you ready? Um, you know, from a mental standpoint, he's very mature. Uh, from a physical standpoint, he can do everything that you're, you're going to ask him. Obviously, the speed is different. The athletes are different around him. The athletes that he's going against are different. So it's just going to be all about what the pieces are around him and then, you know, how that all fits for him. Last question. Do you think the Patriots are going to draft him? <laughs> I don't know. I don't know. I don't have a crystal ball. Can't predict the future. So I don't know what they're going to do. And uh, if they do, they'll be happy. If they don't, they'll have to play against them maybe. So we'll see. But uh, excited for him and excited for his family. How much tire kicking have they done down there at Michigan on, on J.J.? It's done a good bit, but a lot of teams have. So, uh, you know, we're in spring ball right now. We're really focused on our team here and doing everything we can to make sure we got a successful team and build a successful program and continue what we've done here. So, but I know he's had a lot of talks with multiple teams. So it'll be interesting to see what happens next Saturday, next Thursday. 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 Hope, hope it ain't Saturday. Yeah, next right. Thursday. Sharon Moore, uh, I had mentioned – in 2001, I spoke to another Michigan head coach, Lloyd Carr, the week after Drew Bledsoe was injured about a quarterback from there and how he thought he would work out with the mm -hmm. Patriots. That quarterback was Tom Brady. I appreciate 23 years later you taking the time to talk about another Michigan quarterback who has potentially an opportunity to do some damage here. Thanks again, Coach. No, I appreciate you. Thanks for having me. Well, that's the name of that, Joe. Now, let's bring in the Senator Phil Perry. Phil, how are you? I'm doing great. I just lost my light, though, so I'm not going to be as well lit as you're accustomed to seeing. Yeah, well, you know what? This pod is so good that it's always lit. Um, listen to me. Bill? Not wrong. Sorry. I've been talking a lot today. Um, you've done such a fantastic job on the draft, and what I want to focus on with you today is a developing angle, and that's the Michael Penix visit angle which to me would insinuate, hey, is this team actually considering a trade down because they're not going to take Penix in the top four at number three, and they are not going to be able, most likely, to sit there and have him available at 34, most likely, just giving the dearth of quarterback talent once you get past the first four and the number of teams that need one. So you've done a great job laying out some different trade scenarios for Michael Penix, which we'll get to. But what's your first reaction to the Patriots' trade-down possibility, acquiring more picks, and then drafting Michael Penix? You have to be ready for it, right? You have to be prepared if the Vikings say, actually, you know what? I, we're not sure we're going to be able to get an extension done with Justin Jefferson, so we'll throw him into our trade offer for number three, too. That's how badly we want Drake May, or that's how badly we want J.J. McCarthy. And so we'll give you two first-round picks, a first next year, and Justin Jefferson. How about them apples, Elliot Wolf? You trying to get that job locked in for the foreseeable future? You want to, you want to be something more than the director of scouting in title? This will get that done for you. You got to be ready for that, because if mm -hmm. that happens, I wouldn't blame them for saying, yes, please. That's what we want. And you got to so, be ready for it with 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 Denver, with the Raiders, with the Giants, where they're giving you this year's, next year's, and then maybe some player you haven't even thought of who's an immediate addressing of a need that you have. Yeah, I think if some team gets crazy, right? That's what you hope. That's what you would be open to, and so thereby uh, forcing you to prepare for the situation where Michael Penix is the is the best of the tier two options on the quarterback list. And so I don't fault them for doing this. I think it does tell me that they are still genuinely 
keeping that trade possibility in mind because not only are you not taking him at three, you're not taking him after taking one of the top tier quarterbacks either. So like this would be plan B move down, whether you take him in the first round or you take him near the top of the second. I don't even know if he's going to be at the top of the second to your point, Tom, you've got, you've got at least got to be prepared for this opportunity. And so spend as much time with him as you can. What's, what's interesting about it, Tom, is that they haven't taken every opportunity to spend a lot of time with him. Mm -hmm. They, They didn't meet with him at the combine. They didn't, um, send a ton of people to his pro day. Now there was another pro day happening the same day. So that's just sort of luck. And that is what it is. Um, but they could have familiarity because of the receivers coach. Correct. That he had at Washington, who is now on the Patriots staff. Yeah. Tom Tyler Hughes. He's the receivers coach for the Patriots. He spent last year with Washington up close and personal with Michael Penix as an analyst and an assistant there. So maybe they feel as though, Hey, we already know. What are we going to find out about him in 15 minutes that we, you know, at the combine that we don't already know. So that may be their stance on that. So that being the case, what do you think they're learning about Michael Penix and bringing him in? I mean, you got a guy who's got massive, massive, massive hands who spins the ball really as well as anybody in the draft. I mean, to watch the ball come out of his hand and the way that it looks in the air is unique. The direction and platform it comes off of is a little bit, disconcerting and he's got bad knees so you got a guy with a whip release who never gets sacked who's pretty athletic but who has two bum knees and a low release but he's a good leader but he's sketchy in terms of accuracy underneath but he really is good down the field well that's because you get x receivers can run under the ball and everybody's good down the field if you have good receivers so what do you make of this guy i mean is is this guy worth it with the knees at number 34 even in my opinion, no, not for them. Not he's where not for them. you're in a draft. Where and he's you, not for, is it, is it, he's not for them or he's not that good. Sorry, buddy. I think it's both. I think it's both. I think especially not for them. To me, where he fits is on a team with a really good offensive line where he can work from the pocket and throw the ball down the field to really fast receivers who can win in contested catch situations. To me, the Patriots don't have what they need to allow that guy to succeed. And he should not be because he's 24 years old and because he does have bad knees. And he can get all the the clearance that he needs from NFL doctors, from team doctors. And it sounds like he he got through the combine and the medical medical checks there uh, relatively well, considering his history. But is it only a matter of time before two ACL surgeries to the same leg start to bother you. So, you know, this is not a developmental player Mm -hmm. and you do not have the roster to support a non-developmental player who has the skill set that Michael Penix has. That's my opinion on it. And so I wouldn't even at in the second round, Tom, that to me is a valuable spot at 34 because there's going to be real receivers and real tackles there. And so I would prefer to use that draft pick for one of those. And and here's the thing that's dangerous. While you can make the case on McCarthy, May, Daniels, and say, well, anyone would have done that. When you do have a guy with two wheels repaired, refurbished, reconditioned, and if the knees go and you don't have a huge backlog of championships and playoff appearances with your team as the head GM or the guy in charge of the personnel, should say head GM, then it's harder. Well, why why would you take a guy with two bad knees anyway? What were you thinking about? Why didn't you just take Drake friggin' May? Yes, he's got 31 interceptions so far this year, but still, he's playing. So you made a point in the uh, email for early edition, and I loved it. So I'm going to appropriate it, and I'm going to read it. Not in your voice, because you've got a beautiful baritone that I can't match. But Phil's point is Spencer Rattler. Or, as we probably more likely would say, Spencer Rattler. Phil makes a point. Can get him later. Excellent arm. Brutal offensive line situation last year at South Carolina. But he can move around. He can buy time. He can sling it. He's a little smaller. He's probably not the leader that Penix is, but his knees are intact. And I think he has the creative playmaking ability that separates the best guys today in a way that Penix doesn't. If May is your big swing in the first round, Rattler would be your big swing in the third. I would prefer that in saving a second round pick 
for an offensive tackle or wide receiver. I'd prefer that to taking Penix at 34 or higher. I also think that Rat, Rat Spence is sort of this swashbuckling, overconfident son of a bitch. I think you need some of that to succeed here. So give me a little Spencer Rattler. Then we're going to roll through your trade scenarios. I did say SOB. It sounds a little more grating when you son you of a bitch spell, spell it out like that. Like I don't love that, especially. Um, I'm going to leave it alone. But, um, uh, yeah, I I just think if if the option is Rattler at 68 versus Penix at 34 or higher, I would much prefer Rattler. I I, I see him as the kind of guy that if he hits and everything clicks and he's in the right situation, gets the right coaching. Well, he has some of that off schedule off platform, strong arm playmaking stuff that is really hard to find. And it did not always go well for him at Oklahoma. He left, he called it a toxic situation. He was, you know, there are questions about his personality, his ability to lead. They followed him really since high school. Yeah. Uh, He was, he was supposed to be three years ago the cream of the crop in this draft yeah. prior to Caleb yeah. Williams emerging. And he, he has matured is what people will tell you uh, over the course of the last few years in South Carolina. I think he was humbled. He lost his job to Caleb Williams. And so had to move on, went to the sec and it didn't always go great, but for somebody who was in the situation he was in with a pretty bad offense line. Now he had a really talented receiver last year in Xavier Leggett. Um, but boy, he was on the move all the time and, and still able to make some pretty impressive plays albeit inconsistently, uh, that's the kind of dice roll that I'd I'd be more willing to take. And again, I just, like, you want to play a game, Tom? You talk about the trade-down scenarios where, mm, where Penix will be involved. I love this trade-down. Right. I'm looking at it right now. So let's start with a, a, a short trade-down, just a little skip hop and a jump down to six. And you probably get a future, you could, you could maybe get a future first round pick in that exchange. You don't add anything for this year. So that may be a little bit of a drawback, but maybe you get their first round pick for next year. So at number six, you take a tackle and you go with Joe Alt. You get the best tackle on the board. I think that's sort of the Packers way would be to go tackle over receiver that high in the draft. And then at 34, you normal second round pick, you take Penix. And then 68, your normal third round pick, you take Jalen McMillan, who we talked about on next Pats quite a bit out of Washington, uh, Penix's teammate, so you have that nice little connection there. Uh, but he's sort of a Z play inside, play out, really good route runner. And then the other, you know, option though, if you're more of a Rattler guy like me than a Penix guy, you might go six with Joe Alt. You might at 34 draft Xavier Leggett, like a legit X receiver, which I think the team really needs mm-hmm. instead of Penix. And then at 68, you get your quarterback. So do you prefer Alt, Penix, McMillan? Or Alt, Leggett, Rattler. For me, I would pretty quickly say the second option. I would prefer to talk to Minnesota. You would prefer to three. talk to Minnesota. So you could get eleven twenty three in a future. Yeah, first, because your more. next because your next option that you have, I really would want to get more than just that that first round pick. I would again look back at my roster and go, I need to add more. If I'm going to move off of these four quarterbacks here, three quarterbacks, I need to get more. So let's roll through your Minnesota look yeah. for Penix and Rattler with the Patriots trading down and not holding them up for next year. Now, I think that they will. They have to. It has to be 11 I thought it was 23. 23. It 11, 23. 23, and then a first rounder from next year. And I think you have to extract a player. It's not going to be Justin Jefferson. I mean, you're going to be out of your mind if you're going to trade up and trade Justin Jefferson. You're just, I don't even know about Christian Darasaw, although that'd be wonderful. But say it's a first and a second next year. So you go up there. And then what do you do if you're the Patriots and you take Penix? Roll through it, bud. Yeah, so Penix, in this scenario, maybe you feel like you got to take him with that second first-round pick because somebody might get aggressive and and get him before he gets to 34. So at 11, maybe you go tackle. Again, you go with a Penix teammate. You go Troy Fautanu, one of the best offensive linemen in this year's draft. And so, okay, you're going to you're gonna have him be your left tackle of the future. Then at 23, your second first-round pick, you take Penix. 
Then at 34, maybe that's where you get Xavier Leggett. So you get your X receiver, you have a left tackle, and you have Penix with your first three picks. And then at 68, maybe you feel like you need another receiver. <laughs> maybe you don't feel great about mm -hmm. you know, Kendrick Bourne bouncing back from injury. And so at that Z spot, there, there you go, get McMillan. So you come away from this thing with three Huskies, Tom, three Washington Huskies and Xavier Leggett. The Rattler scenario would be. And now I like this. Here, here's the interesting thing, because I would interject on Penix. I just think they're so quarterback thirsty. I would bet that the Raiders or Broncos might figure a way to say, you know what, let's make it work with this guy. I mean, Peyton's older, Sean, in Denver. He could look at him and go, look, maybe the knees give out, but what the hell? I like this kid's moxie. I like the way he slings it. They don't have Jerry Judy anymore. But, you know, you could see something like that happening. And so you have to make a move. You you find out Penix is gone. He's gone by 15. So now you're in the Rattler scenario, which could be more likely anyway. Right. And so in that one, like, just to try to keep it as consistent as possible, let's keep going with Fautanu at 11. At 23... Okay, Penix is gone. Damn. Ugh. But you don't like Bo Nix enough to take him here. All right, you got your tackle. Let's go ahead and get your receiver here. Let's get Brian Thomas Jr. from LSU. A true X, 4 3 3 40, big body, go up and get it. Exactly what they need. So now you got your tackle and your receiver. 34, again, Penix is gone. And you're looking at Rattler and you're saying, well, we kind of like that guy, but we think we could get him in the third. Let's hold off. Maybe you get your second receiver here. Again, instead of, um, McMillan said so Jalen McMillan in the third. Maybe you go with Ricky Pearsall in the second out of Florida. I think could be your Z. I think he could. I, you know, you don't want to get into. Um, I think you're wary of, if you're talking about the draft, you're wary of making uh, race based comps, Tom. But Ricky Pearsall is a white receiver who I think could play a similar role to Julian Edelman. Play a little bit of inside, play a little mm -hmm. bit of outside. He's not going to run by you because he doesn't run a 4-3 along the boundary, but he could do just about anything you need, and he's got great hands. Um, so you get him at 34. So now you've completely remade your, your receiver room, and you got a tackle. Now you get that third-round pick to take Spencer Rattler. So it's Fautanu, Brian Thomas, Ricky Pearsall, and Spencer Rattler. I, I, like that. I like that scenario just in terms of how those picks get allocated and and – you could do whatever trade down scenario you want. I, I think I'm always going to like it more with Rattler later as opposed to Penix earlier. Do you think it'll be difficult Thursday night and Friday night for Elliot Wolf to look at Robert Kraft and say, don't worry. I know what I'm doing. I know you want a top tier quarterback. I got just the guy tomorrow. <laughs> That's. That's why old Sp that's why Spence might be, as you mentioned earlier, take him anyway. Do what Elliot Wolf would have done. Do what you know Mike Shanahan did. Go ahead, take JJ McCarthy, but also take Spencer Rattler because he's hanging I'll around. Take two, double up. Yeah. I, I Only if he's sitting there until the fourth, though. What about Joe Milton? Grab him in the fourth. You know, get your JJ McCarthy, but also you get your cannon arm. See, now you're going overboard because we they, they do have a lot of roster spots that they got to fill here. You can't just be throwing fourth-round picks at back of quarterbacks. I don't like that. Part. I mean, what do they get in fourth round half the time anyway? I don't know. You ever heard of Shaq Mason? I don't know. You ever heard of what they take, the punter or the kicker last year in the fourth round? <laughs> the kicker. How'd that go? Not great. That's a that's a, that's a beetle. Beetle slash zo. How'd, how'd that go? How'd that go? Oh. <laughs> yeah, I like that. I like that. Um. I think your first question is appropriate for us to ask. With ownership being on the record, wanting a top-rate young quarterback, is it possible that they trade down? I, I I find it increasingly hard to believe that they will do that. I Tom, I feel like Robert Kraft has probably known for months that the league believes there to be three quarterbacks at the top of the draft that are all pretty legit. And so not only do I think it'd be hard for him to, to, to see his team trade out knowing that I think it'd be hard to see his team draft JJ McCarthy. It, oh, I, I, I think that who sold Robert, sort of a Johnny Robert come lately. Yeah, no, he loves the syrupy. He loves, he loves 
him some sentimentality. Did all that. I'm not sure going quarterback here or did pretty good. Pretty good. Yeah, but wouldn't I you can't also, you see the phone call same... right now? Yes, I can. You're right. But but couldn't you also hear him saying, "Why haven't you told me?" I'm not going to do the voice, but you could do the voice. Why why haven't you told me about this guy? Why was I not hearing anything about this guy two months ago? And but then you know Elliot, that's not true. Ellie Wolf shoots back. Do I? Yeah, I know it's not true. You know the Patriots have have fought highly of all four quarterbacks in general. I think. I so think if they didn't hear general, it, they didn't ask. I think it's in general. Like but if the, ownership didn't hear the Patriots like four quarterbacks, it's because they didn't ask. That's my feeling. Okay. And the pre-sell on J.J. McCarthy would have had to have happened before they flew his posterior in here. And can't you see that little wavy-headed, cheeky guy go, hey, Robert? Well, you just heard Sharon Moore talk about how persuasive the little fellow was. Did you know that Andrew Stuber – said he'd run through a wall for him when he was a freshman. That's pretty great. That's good stuff. You'd like to hear that. If I I see Andrew Stuber in the draft room, that's a tell. (laughs) Uh, If I know who, if I could point out Andrew Stuber, that would also be a stunner. (laughs) I, I would also be a tad concerned just a tad if i was ownership and the first like five things i hear about a quarterback prospect have nothing to do with how he throws the football. <laughs> well it's funny you say that because even in my delightful interview with sharon at the top of the program i needed more meat on the bone with physical football. skills Physical Football. skills. Yes. Yeah. yeah. You know, the I think the first thing he said about the physical is he's an underrated athlete, which I completely believe to be true. He is criminally underrated as an athlete in terms of both arm strength and foot speed. Be that as it may. He's not an easy sell in the wake of Mac. You know, it just he's he's a tough sell. And we're going to talk about that tonight on Quick Slants, which begins at 6 o'clock. There will be a Michael Penix inter- uh, poll that Phil and I will weigh in on. There will also be the Patriots and their strength of schedule, as according to uh, Warren Sharp and Sports Information Solutions. And finally, what are the limitations of Drake May in terms of throwing the ball from a clean pocket? Everything. Join us on Quick Slants tonight. You should see Phil's face when you say anything Drake May negative. The brow furrows. We'll see you at six on Slants. All right, bye.